It had taken a while, but James Crook's hard work and dedication were starting to pay off. The actor-musician from Katona, New York, had worked his way up from doing regional theater and singing in rock and roll cover bands to what could be his chance at the mythical big time. Comedic genius Steve Martin was holding auditions to round out the cast for his play Picasso with the La Pena Gilles, in preparation to take the show on the road for a national tour. The chance to work with Martin had brought out the cream of the Hollywood acting crop. Competition was stiff. This audition would not be easy. James knew that whatever the script called for, he could pull it off and get the role. It's what he'd been doing since he made his big screen debut as a teenager in the film Shakedown, starring Peter Weller and Sam Elliott in 1988. It was a small part, but the experience confirmed to James that he had chosen the right career path. People couldn't help but notice Crook was naturally at ease when on stage performing. A trait that cannot be easily taught, and live audiences can sense if the performer has it or not in a heartbeat. It draws them in. They want to be part of the good time you're having up on the stage as an actor or musician. James always had a good time on stage, and it showed. He was living in San Francisco when a casting agent got word that the producers of Picasso at the La Panagio now wanted him to audition for Mr. Steve Martin in person in Los Angeles. Their decision to fly James to LA was a game changer for Crook. Martin had spent considerable time in Las Vegas as a comic and had seen the late great Elvis Presley perform and had met him in person on a few occasions. Martin had some idea what the real Elvis was like and his, this persona was the basis for a character in the play simply known as The Visitor. After sitting down with James for a few minutes, Martin knew he had found The Visitor. He had found his Elvis. He had found James Crook. James had sang a couple of Elvis tunes and cover bands years before. He knew he could produce a nearly spot-on version of Presley vocally, no problem. Now it was time to learn all he could about the man from Tupelo, Mississippi. He threw himself into the part, studying concert footage, interviews, and the huge collection of Presley movies. James began to incorporate the trademark moves and subtle nuances that made Elvis the king into his acting arsenal. Two years and 500 amazing shows later, James King Crook had not only arrived, he had come into his own. A crowd favorite during the show, the reviews were in and James nailed the part of Elvis like no other. After the tour ended, James was kicking back with actor John Stamos. Stamos' girlfriend was friends with James's then girlfriend. It was Stamos who encouraged James to pursue a career as an Elvis tribute artist. If this move was going to be successful, James knew he would have to make sure of a couple things. First, get in the best shape of his life, both physically and vocally. To truly connect with Elvis and rock and roll fans, this show could be no Presley caricature. His performances had to be as close to the real deal as possible. Within seconds of hitting the stage, any stereotypical bad Elvis impersonator misgivings the audience might have had about James simply had to be destroyed and put out of their minds. He had witnessed this phenomenon firsthand while on tour with Picasso at the La Panagio. He knew he could do it again, only this time he would be even better. Second, put together a team of musical black belts to back him up live. If James was going to give his all, then it made sense to go after the very best players available. A core group of musicians was selected, and they were dubbed the Big Boss Men by James. Other quality players have become members of the group on an as-needed basis. Smaller venues, smaller group, and vice versa. With these two goals accomplished, he knew it was time. 